There are so many good trading podcasts and blogs online, but it's not often that you get to see the interviewer be the one who gets interviewed. And that's what makes today's episode so special. Today, I'm sitting down with Tony Greer, original contributor at Real Vision and the founder of TG Macro, one of the longest standing trading newsletters online. Tony has had the opportunity to sit down with some of the brightest minds in trading. Combining that with his own experience as an institutional trader, he has a plethora of knowledge to share with the rest of us. So Tony and I sat down to have a conversation about trading, to talk about what he learned from all these different people. My name is Sean Ryan. I'm the co-founder of Predicting Alpha and the host of the Predicting Alpha podcast. If you enjoy this interview, make sure to subscribe because we have a ton more on the way. And with that being said, let's hop into the conversation. I, I was um, hell bent on becoming a trader from the time of, from a very young age. My dad traded over the counter stocks for Dean Witter for 30 years. And so when I got out of school, I knew that I wanted to get a job on a trading desk. Um, wound up starting at Sumitomo Bank in foreign exchange on the 107th floor of the World Trade Center. And that began what I call the first leg of my career, which is where I traded commodities um, and currencies for 10 years. I spent the bulk of that. I also worked at UBS, spent the bulk of that 10 years, though, at Goldman Sachs in the J. Aaron division, which is their commodity trading arm. And that's where I really learned everything I know about trading rigor and really everything I know about following markets and trading. So um, I was there through um, the IPO in 1999 and through the beginning of right into the internet bubble peak of 2000 when I left. And I sat down, I left because I was investing in tech stocks on my own and I had a chance to go and trade them for a sort of outside entity that was being built. And so, yeah, and so I walked face first into the bubble burst of the NASDAQ. So that was a really, really valuable life experience to have under my belt looking back. Um, you know, I left the commodity space and went to work in, you know, equities to trade equities. And, you know, I turn around and there goes the commodities on a super cycle <laughs> for 10 years, you know, so it's, uh, it was really, it was really, really a great lesson about bubbles actually in my own career. Um, but then I segued into the second half of my career was a lot of fun too. I segued into becoming an equity sales trader by applying everything I knew about commodities and sort of teaching my network of people in the equity business, what was happening in the markets. And the timing was really good for that, as you can imagine, since there was yeah. a commodity bull run going on um, alongside a commission paying bull run, which was a really fun time. Like I said, I spent the bulk of that at Dalman Rose for about six years, which was really a maverick sales trading shop, like the definition of a shark tank and, um, had a great run there until Cowan bought that firm. And now I'll get to the final point is from that point, I jumped around to three different wall street firms and got tired of playing what I called pickup basketball with my career. And the sort of one steady thing that I had looking back over the whole entire time since I started in equities was that I wrote about markets every day. And I wrote about my observances. I'm a pretty good writer in terms of translating ideas to writing. People like to read what I write. So there was a natural segue into you know, creating my own product. And I had a big enough group of my own clients that I had developed over the years that encouraged me all the way and said, your work is definitely good enough to set up on your own. So I launched TG Macro. I launched a formalized daily newsletter about markets called The Morning Navigator, um, branded the heck out of it, um, got the original subscribers all on board, and then figured out how to become an entrepreneur, you know, in the sort of, uh, I don't know, 20th reiteration of my trading career. <laughs> And, and so, you know, now I spend all of my time analyzing markets, writing about markets, you know, trading my own account and trying to build my publication and execution business. And so, you know, my, my life hasn't changed all that much, except I'm a one man show. And, you know, I've got a really great knock on wood group of clients that respond to my calls. And so that's what keeps the um, keeps the meter running here at TG Macro, basically, Sean. And I hope that covers uh, the whole arc of my career in good enough fashion for you yeah, without not going into too much detail. <laughs> no, I actually did a really good job at that. Um, and yeah, sorry if I'm, it was a little uh, long. No, I'm I'm blown away by uh, how many different areas of the uh, of the entire world of finance, I guess, that you've you've uh, dabbled in. And uh, 
it, it, it's truly phenomenal. I actually, we got, we got to go back to the start there a bit. I, I got a few questions for you. Um, yeah, go ahead, man. So you mentioned a couple of lessons from tra- trading through the, uh, the dot-com bubble and uh, bull run after it. What were those lessons? Like, what's the one that you, you think, uh, you know, cause we, we've, we've been on besides COVID, we've been on quite the tear recently, uh, you know, and, and since COVID the, this bull run has been, uh, you know, impressive. What, what sort of lessons do you have for someone in, in this uh, type of environment that you think you can take from that uh, trading during the bubble? From my experience during, during the, the dot com bubble. Yeah. There, there's a lot of, um, there were a lot of cliches, a lot of humbling cliches came true right in front of my face. Sean, you know, like, um, you know, I learned about, I learned what a bubble was from being on the inside of it. Right. And, you know, I was investing in these tech stocks because I had a leg into the sort of the music side of tech because I'm a big music fan. So in the mid nineties, when Amazon started and I realized that I could have CDs delivered to my home apartment, download them onto my computer and go running around the park with this little tiny, you know, Sony Walkman digital drive that I was onto something. And so, you know, I started investing in these companies and at Goldman Sachs, you had to hold things for 30 days when you bought them. And I didn't know, you know, I was really kind of short term trading at the time, not knowing if this was going to get me killed, you know, buying these momentum trades and having to hold them for 30 days. And as bubbles do, you know, sometimes after 30 days, my, the stock that I bought would double, you know, and you'd want to buy more, you know, and oh, it was man. one of those infectious things. Yeah, but it was, you know, I'll say the biggest lesson was sort of being on the inside of that bubble and not consciously realizing I was in one until, you know, the signs of the, you know, the frying pan hitting you in the side of the head after you leave, you know, after you transition out of the most powerful commodity trading desk, mm-hmm. you know, at any investment bank and try something on your own, you realize, you know, the value of the franchise that you were just sitting at, you know, and so there's a little bit of that to it. And then starting off on your own, you realize that you need to wear a lot of hats, you know, to be able to go out on your own and start your own business. So, you know, a lot of um, it, it, most of it came with, you know, also things like, you know, thinking bull markets, making people think that they're smart. You know, I thought I was making a really Mm -hmm. smart decision, you know, leaving, Goldman, the J. Aaron division and going into, you know, what I thought was going to be, you know, a very, quite frankly, short career trading technology stocks like that was the game plan. Because when you can sit there and, and bang out, you know, $15,000, $25,000 a day in trading profits with the volatility that was going on, you know, you get a calculator out and you figure out how many more days you have to do that before you don't have to do that anymore, you know, and that was literally my psychology. And it was, and it was, I feel like that lesson where, you know, people think they're very smart during a bull market. And I definitely felt victim to that and, uh, you know, made a decision that I, that I don't, that I don't uh, regret at all, but a very valuable one, in fact, for my career and made me who the person that I am today. Um, but still it was like, you know, it was a typical market thing. It was walking into a bubble saying, okay, you know, let's go with the NASDAQ trading 5,300 on its way down to 2,500. You know, so there were some valuable lessons within that, you know, whole period as well. So the whole thing was a tremendous learning experience. And uh, I really, I probably wouldn't change, I wouldn't change any of it because it's been exciting along the way. And I'm really happy with where it landed with me now working for myself and not reporting to anybody because of some of those valuable lessons that I got. Oh, for sure. And I I know this is primarily a trading podcast, but towards the end, I'm definitely going to ask you a lot about uh, uh, TG Macro and, and your experiences there, because I do find even... I think there's, and this is something I'm going to ask you about right after this. I feel like there's trading principles that transcend what sort of asset or industry you're in that uh, really, whatever you choose to do, if you, if you embrace these types of principles, um, they're applicable. So what, yeah. where I was originally coming from, why I brought that up is over your career of, of working at a trading firm, it sounds like you traded a number of different assets. And I feel like there's always merit in learning your product, whatever product you're trading, you should understand it. If you don't, then how do you even know if you're on the right side of the trade? But there's got to be things that overlap across these different assets. What are, what are some of those things that you noticed that regardless of if it was Forex commodities, equities, whatever you were trading, there was the same sort of philosophies or methodologies. Yeah, I think, and you know, from starting off in, um, in the treasury department, of two banks of Sumitomo and Union Bank of Switzerland, 
you get the value of the plumbing that goes on underneath the financial system. I forgot how I wanted to put it, but that's how I wanted to put it, right? So you're at, you're at, in you're trading FX, you're trading currencies, or you're trading um, gold or silver, precious metals for you know a big investment bank. Um, as a forward trader, which is the desk I started on, you have to immediately understand like from overnight funding through funding things for years, right? So you, you, you come to grips with understanding how people are funding certain positions, right? You understand what the mechanics of actually funding that position is. You know, you understand how you have to pivot towards the money market when you need funding or when you have you know, dollars left over to put into a money market, right? And so from understanding, you know, the beginnings of that, you know, you can start to understand when, when crises hit the market and, you know, problems with that plumbing became obvious, you know, you were kind of a step ahead of some of the other macro traders because you were like, oh, I was in that seat. I know what it means when a bank won't take another bank's name, for example, you know what I mean? Like just to take a bold, bold incident, like the beginning of the Lehman crisis, mm -hmm. right? That was really helpful to have a background in the treasury department when, you know, you're talking about the beginning of that crisis was when counterparties were turning each other down and, you know, the news got out and you were saying, hold on a second, we're no longer trading a hundred million dollars at a time with Lehman brothers, right? Where they're no longer the same credit risk. And you'll see, you see money markets tighten up and, you know, as someone who has experience, you know, dipping to the money markets, both for funding and for um, liquidity, you are, you know, your, your radar goes way up. And, you know, there's people sitting around you during, you know, for example, the great financial crisis when, you know, the credit markets are coming apart and they're very calm about things. And you're like, I don't know, man, you <laughs> guys see the credit markets like, this is not normal. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how the stock market is going to stay up here. Yeah. You know, there's funding issues all over the place. The credit markets are coming apart. Like, you know what I mean? And then two or three months later, the freaking equity markets collapse. You know, so it's all having that experience of, of sort of seeing where the fires are, I guess, from having, you know, a, a cross asset class experience, if that's fair to say. It's almost like because you had these different experiences, you have uh, little nuggets of information that if you were only in one, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have had because uh, you don't get exposure to those types of problems. And then by you're having these right. different pieces, you can, you can kind of connect them in a different way than the average investor. Well, that's the thing is you have those bits of information that you experienced and, you know, you put them together and apply it to this situation. And it's actually knowledge now, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like flat out applying your market knowledge to the mark, you know, to what's going on at hand and just, you know, having the sense to, to change your demeanor right on the trading desk to change your demeanor to your clients, you know, to show them that you've got some heightened issues and concerns about what's going on and, you know, point to point at a few, you know, charts or a few, um, you know, funding uh, market-based inflation indices or something like that and say, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, look at this. What do you think of this? You know, the market doesn't look like it's picked up on this yet. What's the story. And so just having that experience, you know, you get very analytical and cynical, if you will, about yeah. things that you see. Well, yeah, you almost have, you hold it to a higher standard than, than the average person. And, and when it doesn't meet that standard, it's like, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> Trade, trader, traders and poker players are the most cynical people in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. there's actually a ton of overlap between poker and trading. Uh, uh, definitely a lot of the traders I know are poker sharks and a lot of the poker sharks I know are also traders. So uh, yeah. There's definitely a overlap there for sure. So when it comes to like understanding different elements of the market and, and different products, uh, do, do you think that it's important for a retail trader to, to do that? Or do you think it's maybe going a step too far and they can just focus on one product that they think they can find an edge in? How diversified versus specialized do you think it's uh, important for a retail trader to be? Well, I think I have a view, I have a very strong view on that because I teach a retail, I teach largely um, a traded apprenticeship class as part of my, um, my business verticals. Mm -hmm. And I try to help some young traders figure out their way. And what I start by trying to instruct them is that I have six charts that are, you know, price graphs, I should say, on my screen that have been the same six charts in the same position since 1991 when I got my first job, mm -hmm. right? And those six macro securities are U.S. Treasuries, the 10-year bond, the dollar index, gold, copper, crude oil, and the S&P, 
right? So if you're trading in markets, for me, if you ask me, it's really important to know what's going on across those six securities. Because across those six securities, you know, you overlap into interest rate markets, currency markets, commodity markets, equity markets, right? Right. And you've got really yeah. good, those six markets are six good reads on what the world is voting on any given day. Right. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, that that that's how I start my traders off is saying, look, I, I really recommend that you figure out a way to follow these six securities every single day going forward as a sort of backdrop to whatever else you want to trade in the market, because it all stems from this. Right. A, a good commodity trade usually has the tail, the, the tailwinds of a weak dollar. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, gold is usually rallying. Well, usually it's, it's a loaded question now, but usually when interest rates are rising, predicting inflation, gold is usually rallying alongside of that. You know, when, when a currency's interest rates are falling precipitously, usually the currency is going with it because people are getting out of that currency because of the lower yields versus other currencies, right? So you start to learn mm -hmm. those sort of, you know, tactical shifts in the market. And then it all it does really is help you have a little bit of a platform to stand on when you drill down into an individual stock or an individual commodity per se. Yeah. You know, now you have a sort of now 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 it lends itself to okay, what does this play off of? You know, what does it play off of interest rates? Does it play off of the dollar? Is it a industrial that based you know, you know trades on cyclical data? You know, what is it? And so I can help by looking, you know, is it a mine that makes gold that is obviously going to be driven by the gold price? With these six securities, I can sort of get a macro view of the world, and that'll help me understand where my micro trade is, if that's fair to go over it that way. So what I'm sort of taking from that is uh, you should have an understanding of uh, a lot of like width. You should know a lot of, you should be able to see the macro view, the macro lens. Yeah. Right, the big yeah. picture, but and then that that supports whatever sort of micro you go into. Yeah, and you know sometimes I do trade the one of one or several of those securities. You know I'm a big gold and oil trader, so and copper as well. So those are the securities that I traffic in quite a bit. Hmm. But a lot of times, it I'm using those securities as my speedometer to sort of tell me that the you know positions i have in my equity book are either going to have headwinds or tailwinds that day or you know i'm really set up properly right now in commodity markets and if the dollar takes a nosedive then i know i can step on the gas in these trades mm -hmm. because then commodities should be firm if it's a really weak dollar environment you know so i kind of use that um as part of the nuance to my you know to my tactical trading if that's fair to say for sure one of the things that I personally always think about when uh, trying to use um, those to predict each other, right? Like a, you know, a change in interest to predict a change in gold is information just moves so quickly now. And mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? Like, it, it, do you feel that the effective, of effectiveness of that is changing as we move forward and as information moves quicker? And how much of a of an edge do you think there is there still today? Like, is that alone enough to make money or do you overlay other forms of analysis on top of it? Uh, what do you think about that? That's a great question, Sean, because I, I come from an era where I was pulling Dennis Gartman's commodity comments off of a fax machine and <laughs> photocopying them and handing them out to all the traders on the desk so we could have somebody's views in front of us to sort of base our views off of. Your latency right, so that's is based how, on how fast you could run. <laughs> how fast you could run to the freaking thing, how fast you could reload the paper, how fast you could get back to the desk, staple 12 copies, right. hand it out, right? Like unbelievable, unbelievable difference. You know, I mean, my dad was putting individual stock trades in a conveyor belt that were going down to the end of the desk that were oh getting confirmed by the back office. Yeah, like really, really, you know, dark stuff in the information yeah. age. And uh, so there is a really real, you know, what you're, you're correct in saying that the edge that you might have had with slow moving information is now arbed out because the information mm -hmm. is everywhere and it's ubiquitous and in nanoseconds, it's ubiquitous. Yeah. So everybody has full information, real time, all the time, Yeah, you know? And so it's really, really scary world to play in. But what I feel like you have to do is adjust to that vibe 
you know, okay. just like we had to just like we had to adjust to how prices changed trading when we went from, for example, open outcry to all electronics on the New York Stock Exchange. Right. Things used to trade in very slow, but a slower pace, but much bigger blocks with a lot more discussion about price. And now things trade in sort of micro shares and there's no discussion about price and there's not even any there's no concern or dare there be any limit on what anybody would pay for security. Right. Mm -hmm. In the liquidity age. Right. You know, people, you know, I started buying stocks. I used to I used to tease portfolio managers when, you know, I would be buying a stock for them and they would be saying, go ahead, go along with volume and yeah. the stock would be up. Stock would go up two and a half percent in an hour. And I'd say, uh, do I keep buying the stock here? It's up two and a half percent from where we started already. And they say, keep going. You know, I want to buy I want to buy more. And it goes up five percent. And you call them up and say, am I still buying this here? This is up five percent from where I started. And they keep say, going. oh, yeah, keep, keep going. going, keep going. And I say, OK, I have a question. When do we sell this? You know what I mean? Like, like, is there any price that you aren't a buyer? Right. There probably there probably isn't. You know, so anyway, that's how like the world has changed. There used to be a serious discussion about where volume was going to trade on the exchange. You had to give people that weren't even standing there information and lead time to participate on that print so that it wouldn't print without them. Yeah. Right. And now it's just <clears throat> into the wood chipper and gone. Right. Instantaneous. So, you know, it's, you've got, when you go from the average trading size of a block being, you know, 225,000 shares to mm -hmm. now, maybe if the average size is 200 shares, I'd be shocked, yeah. you know? So, you know, that's how the world changed. And that's how, you know, you kind of have to get in the flow of how that changes, right? There's no more big chunks at, 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 at uh, irregular times at sort of contiguous prices. There are prices flying all over the board. Yeah, it's and, so and quick. And through technical levels and back and, and you know what I mean? And, and big, huge jerks into the close that reprice the security to someplace that it was never trading during the yeah. day. And it's like, whoa, you know what I mean? What the hell is that all? You know, for somebody that was very cautious and careful about settlement prices his whole life and, you yeah. know, seeing where volume traded on the exchange today is just a shooting gallery. And it's yeah, like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, how is it possible this stock settled up four dollars from where it was trading volume all day long? You know, how do you, how does that, how does, you know, why can't I settle it down four dollars the next day if I feel like it? Right. You know, and so you know, yeah, it's just all adaptation. It's all adaptation to new to new um, new wrinkles in the market. Yeah, and I guess we're we're basically in this conversation already. So I'll, I'll just formalize the question for you. How would you explain your trading style? If you had to explain it to someone, what would you say is your approach to the markets, the lens you view it through and strategies you participate in? Okay. It has morphed. I, I, I would, I think I could educate and maybe help people a little bit by saying, first of all, that it has morphed dramatically over the years, mm -hmm. right? It, it, and I'll just start by saying, you know, to, to, to kind of teach or employ one of my really important trading lessons is to, you know, not, not, not don't read a newspaper and conjure a view of the world and then go look at the markets and put on your positions and wait for the world to agree with your views. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, a lot of people would be, you know, read, read, read the newspaper and be like, wow, you know, I, I'm really bearish the dollar. Right. Right. Like we have so much debt, like, so, you yeah. know, whatever, there's so many reasons, blah, 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 whatever it is to be bearish the dollar and then go out and short the dollar and say, sit and watch and say, okay, let's see. Is it going my way? <laughs> Am I right? Is it going to prove that I'm right? Right. That, that's the wrong way to trade. How come? The way to trade is to let, well, for me, for me, I like to look at the markets and let them speak and study their movements. I'm like a reminiscence of a stock operator type of trader, right? I like to let the markets tell me what they're doing. I like to find securities that when I look at them from a scale of two weeks, two months, or two years that are mostly going from the bottom left to the top hand right mm -hmm. top right hand corner of my screen right i'm a bull market trader you cool. can wake up every day being bullish or you can wake up being bearish and from the way the s&p has treated me my whole life i wake up being bullish yeah right and so you know i look for i i, I don't like to trade from the short side i don't like to um 
I don't like to sit with positions for a long time at the same prices, right? I like to find pressure points when I think something's going to go, put my money to work for a short period of time, you know, make a, a targeted sum of money or a targeted level of the trade and be out, right? I'm, I'm, I, I sort of, uh, people ask me what my time frames are. And I mm -hmm. always say it depends on the market because if I'm not smart enough to know, you know, what the view of the world is just that I should be in this security that I'm not going to be smart enough to know when I should get out. But what I do is I employ a really careful trailing stop loss strategy mm -hmm. where, you know, the first chance I get, I bump my stop losses to a break even level to prevent losing money. And then the next chance I get, I try to run that stop loss up behind the security that I'm trading from the long side and let the markets take me out on weakness and look to get back in again. Right. I'm, I'm a big believer in trend following. I'm a big believer in sentiment. And when you employ a little bit of technical analysis against that type of platform, you know, and, and, and kind of uh, blocking out the places where you can hurt yourself. Like if mm -hmm. you just say in a bull market, that's as powerful as this one, I'm not going to short stocks. Yeah. Your life is going to be better and you're going to be more profitable than the guy that's trying to short stocks. I don't think it, I know it. Yeah. Right? Trying to time the market is uh, not the easiest game in the world. We can say it's a fool's errand. It's yeah. a fool's errand, right. To try to say, okay, that was the top of the S and P it's been trending yeah, higher for now. 30 years. Right. Exactly. It's a fool's errand. So, you know, you can look at it and say, look, because of the plumbing that the federal reserve and other central banks have created, there really is no alternative to the equity market. There's just no yield anywhere else yeah. in the world. There's no yield. There's no return on commodities right now, although it's starting to change. But, you know, the world is positioned for deflation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are the trades that have been working. And so it's very difficult to change those dynamics in the market. So I've got a question for you about how you actually build a list of things that you dig a little deeper into. How do you go from the entire market to the things that are worth your time to actually, like, look at uh do you Man, have really? like a, a scan that you do or do you maybe use your six macro factors as a a guiding tool how do you do it absolutely those six macro factors number one are a big guiding tool to where i want to be right like I, I i like you know deciding whether we are in a higher interest rate or lower interest rate environment and and be in names that are correlated to that or trade names that are correlated to that but the way that, honestly, things make it to my radar screen, and I believe very much that you will have most success if you have the most limited radar screen, right? Like I, when, when I finally limited myself to being a transportation, energy, and commodity trader, like those three sectors, I used to call myself a tech trader, TEC, transportation, <laughs> energy, and commodities. So when I found, when I limited myself to my wheelhouse, you know, I could find trades that the stars line up a lot better than, for example, in financial stocks or aerospace and defense, right? Like, I don't know the nuts and bolts that make those stocks move necessarily, you know, other than reporting earnings and trading versus sentiment, blah, blah, blah. But I know that if this company like Freeport McMoran makes a living pulling copper out of the ground, mm -hmm. and I think copper can really, really go through, you know, crazy levels through 10K at some point you know, Freeport McMoran becomes a great proxy for that trade, mm -hmm. you know, and so that becomes something that I want to follow. And so in addition to there being an organic sort of set list of securities that lend themselves to my transportation, energy and commodity focus, you know, there's also, a, um, I also have a screener where it's basically got the 10 sector ETFs of the S&P and all of their underlying stocks in it. And whenever, okay. one, whenever one of the stocks, I have it on a uh, mathematical scale, on a sort of distribution scale so that I can measure the number of standard deviations the stock moves in a day, right? So not only, not only measure them in percentage terms against each other, but just stack them in a list and sort them by the biggest standard deviation so I could see what the real biggest mover is. Right. It might be a, it's a bigger move for the dollar index to move one percent in a day than it is for, say, soybeans to move five percent in a day. For sure. Right. So that's like a two or three sigma move in the dollar, whereas in soybeans, a five percent move, it doesn't even register on the on the mathematical scale. Right. It always moves five percent. Are you looking for 
up or down moves for things to make your yeah. radar? So that was really, you know, that was really important, mostly, mostly for up moves as a bull market trader, because I'm a big believer that sort of consecutive large magnitude moves are a signal that a security is departing for another price level. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and when you see back to back sort of, they call it a $20 stock and you see back to back $4 moves, right? Yeah. You know, for me, that's a signal that this thing is probably more likely going to the 40s than the teens. Yeah. You know, yeah. just more likely than not. You know, sometimes there are those head fakes where there's news and it's all wrong, mm. but more times than not in, in very liquid securities, like a couple of days of large magnitude moves sends a signal to me. So that that sets off my technical signals. And that's when that chart, that's when that stock goes on the radar screen. Well, I feel like that makes sense because markets are pretty efficient, right? They're pretty smart. There's right. a lot of very smart people in this game. If it's moving like that, it's probably doing it for a reason. Right. Um, so let me ask you this. Would you then, when something makes that shortlist for you, right? It, 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 it passes your scan. It's now on the list of things you're going to dig deeper into. Are you then going to look into the, the why behind the move? Or are you simply going to stick to the price action of it? It's usually something where I... I know the why behind the move. And this thing is just revealing itself that it is reacting to the why. Mm -hmm. Right. So sure, let me give let me give you an example. Over the last couple of weeks, um, if you follow the steel markets, you know, the price of iron ore came off quite a bit, but the price of steel remained really bid, which was great for the steel producers, right? Okay. And so you had this dynamic taking place where you could, the steel producers could buy iron ore cheaper and they were still able to sell steel at pretty high margin prices. Right. So now you're sitting saying to yourself, wow, the steel stock should be doing better. Right. But that information isn't even, you know, maybe not getting out, but not getting interpreted that way by the whole market. And then sort of the next day, you, the next day, I'll look at the top of my leaderboard and it'll be, you know, U.S. Steel letter X with a two and a half sigma breakout, Cleveland Cliffs with a two sigma rally, um, Steel Dynamics with a one and a half, one point seven five sigma five percent extension to a new high, and I'll see ah, there it is, right? They finally yeah. responded to the tightness in the commodity markets that I was getting, right? That I was getting the information on. So that that's how that's how the best trades line up because then you can say either. You know, you had already started positioning in those steel companies because of the, you know, kind of inside market information that you were following. Or you could say, OK, this thing finally cleared some technical hurdles and is worth being in. Right. Because a lot of times, you know, trades that are doing nothing, you know, stocks can consolidate for a long time and just stay in a sleepy range where nobody cares, you know, and then all of a sudden they'll usually have a couple of large magnitude breakout moves from that range and then they'll start trending. So I always like to try to catch things early as early in that trend as I can. But what I do is sort of when an alarm goes off, when something registers as a big mathematical move, you know, I do my due technical due diligence and kind of see where it is in relationship to the whole, you know, past several months and weeks and years to see, you know, what the play is. That's really, really cool. So one thing that uh, you, cause you mentioned us steel, right? That's obviously quite, quite a big company. Um, how does market cap play a role in things? Is that something you consider? Uh, you know, because the way I think about it personally, for example, I typically stay away from the apples and blue chips of the world because the smartest people in the world are looking at that stuff. That's where all the liquidity is. That's where all the analysts look. And I'm like, I am a small fish in the ocean, if I'm there, I'd rather yeah. maybe go to a pond or even a puddle to, to try and find some food. Does that play a role in, in your analysis at all? Um, and if so, why or why not? Uh, it does only in my liquidity risk, to be totally honest with you. Like I don't, I don't shy away from trading Apple or big cap stocks or stocks that trade 5 million shares a day. Mm -hmm. Like for me, for me, that's a little bit of a safety net. Okay. You know, to know that to know that the pool is full there with with interest on both sides, the ring is full. You know, people are shouting bids and offers. You know that that's a, that's somewhere where I can take risk, just knowing that when it's time for me to be out, I can just hurl my position hurl my position into the ring and be gone. Yeah. Um. You know, with with things that trade by appointment, you know, as you know, as you as you learn when you traffic in stocks for say, you know, uh, 
high yield funds. You know, sometimes you'll trade a, you know, a high yield uh, distressed issue of something for somebody and be combing the streets, looking to see who cares in this bond, in this issue, and just get a lot of phones hung up in your face. And just kind of learning that lesson and saying, you know, I would never want to be in a position with my money like that, where I'm calling up people that, you know, anybody I can to just show me a bid to get rid of this thing. That's not my style. So yeah. that's only where, you know, only where a smaller capitalization becomes less liquidity for me. That's the thing that steps me away from the, from the table. hundred percent. That makes a lot of sense. And I, you know, if you, it's one of those things, liquidity matters so much. Right. Yeah. Even even for getting a, a fair value price, right, or or you know getting the price that you want for a, an asset, a lack of liquidity. It's. I do personally think that there's edge there because that lack of liquidity means there's more room for you to price it better than someone else. But yeah. but then there's there's also it's a trickier game. It's definitely yeah. it comes with its own uh, bag of problems. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a major part of, um, you know, it's a major part of a risk manager's real consideration. So it, it's got to be, it's got to be effectively, you know, discounted or, or, or uh, you know, hashed out on the risk matrix, if you will. Yeah. I guess talking about risk, one of the things that I, I, I always want to ask people because I, I don't think there's like a perfect right answer for this, but it's so important for traders to consider, which is just how do you evaluate when you're wrong in a trade and, and how quick or slow are you to cut it? What's your, your strategy for managing positions that you're wrong, right? Or, or you're, you're starting to think you might be wrong. What's that sort of process look like for you? It's very much the same as missing a jump shot it happens all the time. Yeah. You know? And so you have to, you have to trade with the psyche of, Look, lizard brain up here is only going to be right 55% of the time. I mean, 60 if I'm on fire. I was going right? to say. If, if I'm ice cold, 60, you know, and I, I haven't even seen 60%. I'm just saying, you know, you, you want to make it easy for yourself and, you know, know that if only you're only going to be right that percent of the time that you are going to be stopping out of a lot of positions, right? And, and if, if every position that you put on is potentially one that you're about to stop out of, if, if something goes wrong because you got to be careful with your money, then you're approaching it the right way. Like, for example, I have I have really strict rules for any for the week that I enter a position. You know, I'm, I'm pretty habitual right now. And I oftentimes like don't trade on Mondays or Tuesdays unless I'm liquidating something um, opportunistically. Um, but otherwise, getting into things and adding to positions like sort of offensively, I often trade on Wednesday, Thursday, or even better Friday's close, because I am so strict with my risk parameters for positions that I put on through the end of that week that I put them on. So if I put something on on Wednesday or Thursday, I am like my hair is on fire watching that position tick for tick to get through the weekend. Yeah. Because I'll tell you that nine times out of 10, if I get into something that is turns from a winner into a break, even on Friday's close, I get out then, you know what I mean? Like I have no patience for like babysitting bad positions over the weekend, mm -hmm. taking something home that closed really badly. You know, like I used to be the young guy that thought that I was Hercules and would say, ah, you know, I bought this thing here. These guys are, these wimps are getting out on Friday because they don't want to have risk over the weekend. You know, like I'll be the tough guy. I'll have the risk yeah. over the weekend. Look at these paper and, hands fools. <laughs> yeah. Like these soft, you know, these soft hands. The next thing you're going to come in Monday morning and it opens, it goes down another 5%, yeah. right? That's more likely with a bad Friday close than the stock coming back. So once, you know, once you get enough of those black guys, you know, you decide to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to sell shit that goes out on its ass yeah. on Friday. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to wear that for the way home, whether it's taking profit or something or, or getting out before a loss even hits my stop loss. That's a popular ejector seat trade for me. Mm -hmm. So when, when you see things that don't make you do that, they stand out like a sore thumb. Interesting. Right? Because you don't you don't have to touch them. You put them on on Wednesday or Thursday and maybe for a couple of hours you were out of the money just because of your you know execution moment. But you got a really strong Friday close that confirmed why you got into that trade, right? That's the difference between praying with an E and praying with an A over the weekend. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when you getting into that trade on Friday's close, you're saying, oh, yeah, the market is showing the weak side right now and it's higher and I am going to own them before anybody else does. You know, where it used to be, you know, if you were short and the thing rallied into the close, it was pray with an A, like, don't let this thing go up another 5%. Please don't let this thing go up another 5%. You know, and that that's like, that's being on your heels, getting run over. Yeah, no, you don't want to be versus, in that spot. Versus being the guy on the Friday that's saying, "Where where is it offered on the close? Fifteen, I'll buy them. Fifteen and a quarter, bought them. Fifteen yeah. and a half, where are they? Buy them. You know, and, mm -hmm. and make force the market, force the market to come back and show you sell side. Because even as a retail trader, you can do things like that. I'm trying. I'm trying to wrap my head around that because, like, the weekend. The, I always feel like there's got to be some sort of risk premium there because of the lack Hell of yeah. liquidity and stuff. And, you know, I haven't quite figured out a, a good way to trade it yet, but, you know, I, I wonder if like there's money to be made uh, isolating stuff that's worth buying on a Friday and closing on a Monday, right? And, and oh, yeah. Some sort of overpriced. Oh, there's there. absolutely, there are absolutely ARBs that have been vetted out you know, like that with how, you know, how the market closes on Fridays versus Mondays. But most importantly, I think it's just a factor of being critical about your trades uh, across time frames. You know, like when I'm in a trade, I'm always looking for its weekly closes, right? And I'm always seeing where it closed on Friday and what the performance was for that week. And then if I'm in it for more than four weeks, then I'm looking at the monthly performance. Mm -hmm. And is okay. it putting a streak? Is it putting a streak together? Right? Is it registering a number of green months while I'm in it? Because that's because that's the right position to be in. If it's not registering green weeks, green months, then why am I in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's you know, definitely so, so tricky to be in that spot where you have your initial thesis, and then it's it's going against you. Right? Yeah. it's like when do you cut it? You know, uh, it's it, the hardest so part. You, let, let's say you're you're looking at something that you think will be a four week hold, and week one is red, week two is red. Is it sort of at that point you would say? let's cut a loser here or how do you oh, know yeah. about evaluating that? I know my, I know where my, I know what I'm about. I play, I play the trading game. Like I play blackjack. I know what I'm losing going into the bet, <laughs> right? Like if I'm buying something at five and three quarters, I know that's because the moving average that I can lean on is at five and a half and I can put my stop at five and a quarter, just, mm. just, you know, yeah, theoretically yeah. speaking, yeah. not, not exact dollars, but you know, that I know when I am purchasing something, like, okay, here's where they got to come and get me to get me out. Okay. You know, and, and, you know, the faster that happens, the easier it is to just, you know, be like, whoa, I just, you know, I just burnt my hand on the stove, man. You know, I'm not married to this thing. See you later stock. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't need to worry about those. Right. You just take your little lump and you go home with your black eye and you show up Monday morning with your ball and you go back out and play again. But yeah. You know, it's 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 being in lack of discipline and freezing like a deer in the headlights, and you know, thinking that if you're long something and that it's okay to not participate on days that it goes down in large magnitude and large volume, it's like okay, but that's not going to work very long. You know, you're going to learn the hard way that that's not the way to trade. And you know, when you're long something and it's going down in large volume, you should probably be participating. Yeah. You know, so you, you learned the the hard way from things like that. You know, it's uh, sort of like a funny thing I've seen happen a lot in, in people's uh, trading experience is it has to do with capital allocation. And, you know, you'll see someone who has like a really good, uh, they believe in what they're doing very strongly. Uh, but then let's say they have like a $100,000 account, just an arbitrary number. And they'll trade and have a really good win percentage and stuff, but they come out of the year making four or 5% because their risk per trade was like a dollar. You know, they've had like a hundred dollars risk on the table and sure they made a couple hundred dollars here or there, but relative to their account size, it was, you know, they should have just bought the market or something, right? All this work yeah. didn't give yeah. them that portfolio return that really would have made it meaningful. And on the yeah. flip side though, you have people who come in and over leverage on individual positions and they have a trade that maybe has this, you know, positive expectancy, but they 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 mess it up because of their allocating way too much to a single trade or something yeah. like that. Any comments on capital allocation and doing it efficiently or efficiently? Um, I think the only thing that I can add constructively is, you know, I play with the house's money and not yours. You know, I, I feel like that I I figured out. I figured out how to really effectively use the house's money against the house. 
you know, and when you realize that you're in one of those trades that is in your 55% wheelhouse that you mm. got right, there's going to be something that comes along, I think, Sean, with each decade of trading experience, where when you know, you fucking know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's a yeah. point, like, you know what I mean? When you've got the poker hand that you're going to beat everybody at the table at, you know, yeah. you try not to be poker face, but you're like, Pfft. <laughs> nobody's beating me right now you know and now let's let's have at it you know then i guess that that's when you that's when you want to be able to step on the gas you know what say. i mean and it's like it's kind of like when uh you know you buy something you if you start buying something as it takes out moving average resistance which is a mm -hmm. big part of my strategy right if something is underwater like the bloomberg commodities index chart was like a world-class example of this where the chart collapsed and then one by one, it made it back up above every moving average from the 50 day to the 100 day to the 200 day, and then never rebroke one on the downside. Do hmm. you know what I mean? So it literally climbed the moving yeah. average ladder and kept going. And so when you get into one of those trades, like I mean, like when you know that you got them and you're right, that's when you see you, when you see the trade confirming that you're right and you're grabbing your chips going. Yeah. Yeah. I agree them again, 100%. right? And so that's where a trader, you know, that's the difference between a trader making, you know, being a really positive return, big return trader and a guy that's, you know, scratching out, you know, nickels and dimes here and there. It's when you know that you've got them and you know that you can upsize your bet and, and be still pretty safe in that trade. That is, that is actually really good advice. Um, I, I, I come from the exact same school of thought where you really need to understand like what your edge is in this position that you're in. And if it's big, mm -hmm. you should bet accordingly, right? Yeah. Like, imagine if you had an arbitrage and you have a hundred thousand dollars and you you were betting one percent of your account every time. It's like, come, yeah. what what sort yeah. of lunacy is this, right? You should be, yeah. you should be, you should be borrowing money, you know? Yeah, um, like like we arbitrage. saw it last last year, you know, oil at five dollars, oil at eight dollars, yeah. ten dollars. I mean, that's that's an opportunity that you know, shit, you break the kid's piggy bank open for. Yeah, you know what's funny about that? I actually uh, made a lot of money during that time as well. Uh, but trading USO because people weren't thinking about the roll down, right? They thought they were right. buying spot and, you know, they were actually buying that front month. And uh, it was like, you could just yeah. see the catastrophe about to happen. And you had, you know, in that kind of situation, you, you got to bet, you know, you got to yeah, bet. Yeah, totally. hundred percent, man. And I, I actually bought USO after they changed their rollover rules. Once they bumped it away from the front couple of months, I oh, bought yeah. some just because I thought it would be better. You know, at least it's a better proxy than yeah, to the markets. Sure. It's kind of like buying back month crude oil, which is, a good, you know, sometimes a safer, lower volatility trade sure. than being in the front month. So I, I totally agree with those principles. Yeah, I, I think that's so important. But the, the number one thing on top of that, that, that is so important to say almost as a disclaimer and, and the truth is you got to know your edge. You got to know that you have it, right? Um, yeah. Because, you know, there's a, a saying in poker that my business partner would always say to me, uh, if you go all in, you're only getting called by better. If somebody calls you, you've probably lost. Like if you have like the right. second best hand and somebody calls you, there's a good chance they have the best hand. Right, right, right. But you got to know that's you have point. it. Right? Yeah, that's it. That's the one. And at least when you're in, you know, and, and recognizing in that moment that, you know, you have taken on a lot more risk and you mm -hmm. need to be a lot more focused on the markets and a lot more, you know, dialed into second by second price action with, you know, your hand on the exit button yeah. when necessary. And, you know, once you, once you take all those sort of fire hazard precautions that you have when you have a big precision on, then, you know, you start to manage them a lot better. Yeah. So I want to ask you about Real Vision a bit and, and, and some of the work you've done there, because you've had an opportunity that I would say is extremely unique there, which is you've gotten to speak with some of the biggest traders in the world. Yeah. Right? And, you know, most of the time, like I, I remember for the majority of my trading career, I was the only people I had to learn from were the, uh, the, the retail forums online. So I was relying on other people in my situation to learn from. And sometimes that would be a big hit. Sometimes that would be a big miss. Yeah. But you've had the opportunity to learn from the best, right? Yeah. So what are some of the things you've learned from conducting these interviews and getting to speak to some of these great investors? Real Vision um, has been really, really a great, great partnership for me. And um, I'm really good friends, become really good friends with Raul. And he is, you know, from the beginning, I've been saying that I think he's skating to where the sort of financial media puck is going with Real Vision. 
And that was the thing that brought us together, ironically, is that when I heard about Real Vision, I did some homework and I wrote one of my daily newsletters about it. And I was, you know, kind of recommending it to people, um, you know, in, in its infancy stage, saying that this was going to be an up and coming feature in financial news media. And one of my clients forwarded it to Raul Powell. And he was like, dude, you know, we overlapped the Goldman Sachs. He's like, you know, let's have a conversation. I'd love to have you on the platform. You know, I see that you just started a company and, yeah. you know, you look like you're doing something different as well. And tell me about that. And so the, the synergies were huge. And I'll say that what's cool about Real Vision, actually, that I learned from Grant Williams, who is, you know, one of my good friends in the markets and, and the best mentor that I've had in my career is that people aren't as interested in you being sort of right on a trade idea as as they are in sort of hearing the knowledge that you gained along the way if that's fair you know like people are way more interested you know it's not like like when i write about things in my newsletter people can say people can sense whether i'm you know trying to build my case about why i'm right or you know explain why i was wrong or something like that and that doesn't make for like the best content all the time you know the best content is really making people just think on their own and you make them think on their own by pointing to the pros and pointing to the cons and pointing to the chart and pointing to the characters and to the narrative and to the sentiment and letting them make their own decision. So like, yeah, I guess more honestly, it's more like, um, you know, I've kind of learned how to, how, to, how to go after that knowledge, you know, rather than, you know, what the trade has been, what the, where the money was made. It's kind of like, you know, Grant Grant's the expert at teasing out the actual knowledge from something versus somebody's opinion that turned out to be right or the conjecture. You know, so you more you more have some nuts and bolts about what is learned along the way, and those are the things that make you a better trader that you can apply. You know, it's not even sort of you know mimicking somebody else's trade idea, following along with the trade idea, knowing whether it's right or wrong, blah blah blah. You know, like you, you probably learn more, you know, reading literally reading reminiscence about a, of a stock operator than listening to those trade ideas. You know, those are going to be you know, and I've done them myself, but those are going to be like darts at a at a at a dartboard. Mm -hmm. Some are going to be right, some are going to be wrong. You know, the right ones are going to sound brilliant, the wrong ones are going to sound stupid, and you know that's not really what that's not really what markets are, right? Like that's not necessarily the whole thing. You know, markets are understanding, you know, so many things about a trade perspective, like where you are in the narrative, where you are in sentiment, where you are in price. And, you know, there's enough, there's enough information about a trade that you can kick the tires on and, and bring out really good ideas versus just presenting a view. I guess if that's my point. And you know, you know, what's funny, a, a comment you made, I just had another interview where the, the guest said, um, no matter what strategy you run, you're going to have trades that make you look absolutely brilliant and trades that make you look like a total fool. And you have to just embrace 100%. that as a part of it. But trading is like an iterative process where you're yeah. always improving. You're always trying to learn from what's happened. So I, yeah. I think it's such a skill to be able to tease out those details from other people's experiences. Um, yeah. Sort of like the, you know, you can learn by making the mistakes yourself or from the mistakes of others. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a ton of time. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things. If you learn, if you learn to put the ego aside, right? Like it's a different skill. It's a different skill, you know, and, and being able to identify every shot you take in the market as like, what kind of shot is this? What's my risk? Know that it's something that might be wrong. Be ready to get right out. You know, then you become a trader that's just trading with no emotion and, you know, on pure instinct and technicals and tacticals. And you're much better set up for success under those conditions, if you ask me. I got a question for you. Uh, at the start of this interview, you mentioned that Amazon was one of your big purchases back in the, the 90s. Uh, and it came from your interest in music and then some of the, the, the things that Amazon was bringing to market with the whole CD space. And that's sort of the, uh, like falls into that philosophy of, uh, you know, buy things that you see like changing in the world, right? Like mm -hmm. if you, if you yeah. see a product on a shelf and you go, wow, that's very cool. Or you notice, you know, like, like one that I noticed, for example, was like, uh, you know, my sister and other people all got this Peloton app right back, yeah. back during yeah. the pandemic. They all, they, they didn't all have the, the bike cause that thing's crazy expensive, but they all had this $15 a month app that had live workout things. And it was just popping up everywhere I looked. Mm -hmm. And you know, what do you think about that sort of philosophy? Uh, 
for maybe longer term holding of buying things that you're actually seeing out in the real world? Sort of like what you did with Amazon. Do you think that's still relevant? A hundred percent. It's a necessary strategy, right? Like, like um, value awareness, right? In the markets or, or value, you know, all of a sudden you find something in your life that adds value. Like who makes that? Where did that thing come yeah. from? Like, right. Like how, how did somebody just put me out in central park with this little tiny, you know, disc, and my headphones, right? When I was carrying, yeah. you know, compact discs two weeks ago, how, who did that? Crazy. And, you know, it's definitely your curiosity that gets you there. And, you know, that's, that's, that's always the case, whether it's like a new technology phenomenon, or you're talking about the gold market, which is, you know, hundreds of centuries old, um, however, however you want to put it. So I guess it's, uh, I would say, you know, if you listen to smart investors, like real investors, portfolio managers, you know, they all start off with that, like invest in something, invest in things, you know, you know, invest in things that maybe you understand that, um, you know, not everybody else does and, and, and understand that that's maybe where the value is. I mean, the one thing that was easy for me that made it easy for me in the mid nineties to buy, you know, these tech stocks and names that nobody ever heard of was there was always a, there's always a, a there was always some kind of a ho hum take on something really new and exciting, you know. Like I, you know, I just we, I bought some Amazon. Who the fuck knows? You know, I don't know what's going <laughs> to happen with this thing. And I'll claim I will say that like I didn't, I never got rich off of buying Amazon back then or anything. It was just something that made sense, you know, drew yeah. my interest into the tech market, and so I was able to say, like, like, dudes, look at this. I can get CD like like Motley Crue's last disc comes right to my door when it gets released. That blew your mind, right? It blew my mind, and other people are like an online bookstore dude like so what right. you know and you're like I, I don't know i don't know so what like i like running in the park with this little tiny thing versus this thing like i think this is brilliant but you could say so what and that's why maybe the stock is worth peanuts right now the whole world is so what on this thing you know so it's like yeah. you know that 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 is you learn um also with a lot of gray hair and bloody noses that it's really good to have a lot of pushback on trades that you like to enter Mm -hmm. Right. If you if you you're looking at entering a trade and you call up 10 traders, you know, it used to be really great news for me if I called up 10 guys and they were like, yeah, man, I love this thing, too. I used to be like, yes, I'm as smart as they are. We're all gonna go <laughs> down making money here. This is going to be a big party. Like now I would rather get five guys that are like, dude, you're out of your mind with this. Yeah, thing. You know 100%. what I mean? Like this is not going to go anywhere. Right. Like and if I don't have that, then I'm skeptical. Oh, you know what I mean? Sure. Like that's how, that, that's how the table is turned. Like, you know, I just did an interview with Tracy Shukart um, about the oil markets and we were both bullish and we both said the next $15 should be higher. And I'm looking at her at the end of this saying, you know, the oil market's going to go down $10 now, right? Be yeah, just because right? the two of us, just because <laughs> the two of us are convinced that this thing can only go higher. So, you know, that's those are a, things that you pick up with a lot of experience. I think that's a, a really clean transition into a, a conversation I wanted to have with you about sentiment. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll share with you a couple a couple things about that for me. I, I'm in the exact same boat where if uh, if everybody says yes, I'm wondering who's saying no. Mm -hmm. right? If everyone I know is saying yes, who's the person saying no? Because there's got to be someone on the other side of this trade. If they're buying, someone's selling. That's right? right. And 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 then the other thing I think is well, if everyone agrees, would wouldn't today's price reflect that agreement? Yeah. You know, and I, I start going yeah. down this rabbit hole of. Yeah, maybe they're on the wrong side of the trade here, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and that, yeah. And yeah. Markets are tough like that. A little bit of a, a strategy for me. It's definitely a part of my personal investment philosophy. Is who's on the other side, and and I look at sentiment for things like that. So, how does sentiment play a role in your analysis? And you know, with with the rise of stock twits and Reddit and all these analytics that have come out for retail sentiment, and then you know we we can see you know institutional buying now, and there's all these things that are sentiment indicators in a sense. Do, what do you look at in there and how important is that to you? It's very important. It's very important. You know, the, the, the Barron's front page cover curse is a real deal. You know, that's a real thing. That is, you know, a very real sentiment crescendo alarm. Yeah. You know, for, exa for example, you know, the inflation trade was flying along for the majority of the year. Um, you know, we had those supply shortages, we had, you know, bottlenecking in all kinds of commodities, we had commodities rallying, and then all of a sudden the Barron's cover comes out, the everything shortage with pictures of all kinds of commodities on it. Now, the commodity market didn't stop dead in its tracks there, but 
the market-based inflation expectations readings all peaked out right when that happened, right? So the, so the yield curve in the bond market was at its widest, break-evens were at their highest peak, yields were at their highest, and from that freaking moment on, everything turned. Right. That, so that my point is that Barron's cover was like a full on confirmation that everybody from the portfolio manager to the retail trader to the hedge fund guy was in this trade now. Oh and they want to and they want to read about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's one thing. And, and then next thing, you know, Jerome Powell comes out and makes transitory comments and everything collapses in the inflation mm -hmm. trade briefly. Right. So that was a sentiment peak right there. So, you know, those are the things that you have to read and you have to sort of say, okay, I'm on this inflation trade and I know that there's not a lot of people writing about it right now, right? I'm telling it to my clients, we're expecting inflation. The markets are still tanking in March, but I know that the response to the lockdown is gonna be inflationary, right? More yeah. balance sheet, more accommodation, more uh, fiscal stimulus, all of it's yep. inflationary. So now you can start looking at the commodities. At that time is when the same, like we said, in sentiment wise is when you're asking around and saying, what do you think about buying these commodities down here? And people are going, don't do it. You know, yeah. don't do it. They're still, um, you know, they're still mesmerized by the downward price mm -hmm. action. But that's the only way sentiment, I guess, in my point is it's the only way that you can really read extremes. Right. Yeah. And as a momentum trader, I'm always looking for things to build momentum and then crescendo and then fall back and then get back into trend. So reading the sentiment is very important in staying with the flow of the stock. Yeah. And what's also kind of cool about it is I wonder how much edge there is looking at it because in terms of especially retail sentiment, uh, that I, I think has had such huge leaps and bounds in the last two years, we'll call it with, you know, all the analytics for like, like as more people are talking online, it becomes easier to track what, how bullish or bearish people are, how many mentions something's getting, all of these types Absolutely. of things. And at the same time as, uh, and I could be totally off base here. They might've been looking at this for the last 10 years and I wouldn't doubt it. You know, at the same time as funds are uh, really incorporating this at a higher level in their analysis, so is retail, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Everyone's starting to do it at the same time. And it's, it seems almost like a more fair competition yeah, um, it really is. Especially with some good, of the I think that's, that have come out. Oh, I agree. You know, you can, you know, whenever you can look at it, uh, you know, by the something that has the, you know, the dollar, the dollar tag, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Stock symbol on Twitter has the dollar tag. So whenever I'm, you know, keenly interested in stock, I'll search it on Twitter for the dollar tag. And just reading the comments, you know, you'll get a really good indication of what the world thinks of this thing, right? Are they mm -hmm. high-fiving as it going up or are they hating on it as it goes up like Tesla? Yeah. You know, and things like that. So the things things take on a different character depending on what the market's thinking about them as they go, right? Yeah. Or one that I I I take quite seriously is if a stock is in a downtrend and everybody's bullish. Yeah. Right? If every retail trader is bullish and this is going down, mm. I'm very tempted to short it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I'm very yeah, tempted yeah, to say, course. look, like, because then then you're in a situation where it's it's you know, it's almost like a uh, emotion driven trading at this point, right? It's like, yeah, you can't you can see everyone's you know, hand. Yeah, exactly. Right. You, you know that they don't want to sell for this loss. They're averaging down yeah. there, you know, really trying to make this thing work rather than sticking to a thesis and saying, Hey, I was wrong and getting out. Yeah. It's like, we're really trying to force this one to work. And that's when I'm like, here, I'll provide you some liquidity. Come, come. Yeah, take there you go. <laughs> like, that's right. Yep. <laughs> you want a call option? Here you go. You know, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Um, what do you, you know, I, I guess I uh, wanted to ask you about one more thing, just because, you know, TG Macro, I want to spend some time talking about that. Um, how have you found running your own business in this space? And what overlaps have you seen between the entrepreneurial world and the trading world? Yeah, good question. Good question, Sean, because those two worlds are really colliding. And, you know, that's the reason that I started my own business with a pretty good set of Wall Street relationships that I had accumulated over the years and some really good mentors. Um, you know, you're trying to, you know, my, my, what I was able to do with TG Macro was kind of figure out that the world was going to be consuming information differently and that I wanted to be there to be, you know, one of the voices in the ring. And that's really, that was the genesis of it. And it was from you know, from the time, I guess, from my experiences working at investment banks and sort of maybe, maybe more so even at the last three that I worked at, where 
you know, there was this, there was this sort of old school philosophy still where, for example, um, you know, after an earnings call, an analyst would get on the, the trading desk horn and say, well, those are really good, air, those are really good earnings, Delta. And, uh, you know, this stock should just get up and run for days now and, you know, really should be positive for maybe three, four five days in a row now. And that call would end and I would call up the analyst and be like, did you say that you think this stock could be positive for four, for four or five days in a row? What makes you say that? And he'll be like, well, the earnings were so good. I mean, you know, and I'll yeah. be like, OK, do you see this stock now is trading from up five percent when you said that to now it's down two percent on the day? Jeez. Do you still want to bet that this thing is going to go up for five days in a row because the earnings were so good? That's not what this mm -hmm. game is about. So it was kind of like saying. You know, like not, not all these banks look at this stuff the right way, you know, yeah. and I may not have I may not have the power of an analyst that I'm going to pay a half a million dollars a year to, to you know, sort out stocks in one sector. Yeah. But I do have the ability to identify, you know, correct trades with tailwinds at my back and great risk reward and also wrap it up into a package that's fun to read for people. Yeah. It was like, OK, I have a product in the new trading world. You know, where, like you said, where that new, um, you know, where the new retail trader, you know, is privy to all the information now. He can probably get his hands on anything that I could have gotten my hands on when I was sitting at Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. Right now, now it's all the information is fair game. You can get it if your network's big enough, you can get it from somebody. You know, so that has sort of changed things. And with that change was why I wanted to get TG Macro out there as a voice in the world that would be, you know, among... You know, something why I figured that once I, I latched on to a couple of good views and a good trades that people would give me the credibility to say, well, this is what this guy thinks, you know, and, and sometimes he's going to be right and sometimes he's going to be wrong, just like the investment banks are. But there's no reason why in this world without an accountable set of, you know, maybe better trading back, uh, maybe trading better trading backing behind the trade idea mm -hmm. than they were coming up with. Why can't I have a voice? 100%. Right. So that's. That's kind of how it, uh, that, that was kind of the genesis of why I finally wanted to go out and do this on my own. Brilliant. And just uh, a little shameless plug for you here. Uh, if somebody wanted to get their feet wet with TG Macro uh, and learn more about your approach and get involved, what's the, the easiest way for someone to get started? Yeah, there is um, my website. There's samples of my work at www.tgmacro.com. Um, there are samples of my newsletter. There are samples of my point lookout package. If you want some more recent samples before you subscribe, you can email me at Tony at tgmacro.com and just say if you can get us a few, uh, you know, recent newsletters and I'm happy to share those. I feel like that's the best way to give somebody a, a, a look at my work. I don't really like trials because there's just more and more paperwork involved with that. I'd rather just let somebody see what I do and decide if they want to be a part of it. Yeah. So tgmacro.com, you can look across my products. It'll give you a little more detail into my background and where I come from and kind of what gave me the idea to do this. And um, that's really it. In my newsletter that I write four days a week, The Morning Navigator, I sort of uh, walk my um, walk the subscribers through the trades that I'm putting on. I have a view matrix at the back of it, which kind of rhymes with my trading account most of the time. And um, people think it's great for idea generation and finding good risk reward. So that's kind of what I'm trying to accomplish. Brilliant. Tony, I got to say, thank you so much for coming on. This is, this has really been a, a, a fun and enlightening conversation. Yeah, man. Yeah, it really has been fun. You asked some really good questions. It was fun to hear your perspective. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'm going to link your stuff down in the bio of this video. Um, and uh yeah, I, I, I hope people, uh, you know, at least reach out to you to learn a bit more because that's, uh, I think that newsletter sounds pretty damn good. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Anything, you know, any anyone I can uh, possibly help, I'm happy to. And I try to make myself available to all of my subscribers uh, just so that they kind of feel the, the human side of the business. That's how, we're, uh, yeah. that's how I'm approaching it.